Let's pray. The Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke chapter 3. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip was the ruler of the region Aturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanias the ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet of Isaiah, the the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized and they asked him, teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, but be satisfied with your wages. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We celebrated uh, Thanksgiving in Baton Rouge this week with my dad's side of the family. And my dad has a big family, so there were going to be a lot of us. And my mom um, is sort of hyper uh, detail oriented. And so in preparation for us being together, my mom sent out a few weeks ago a Google sheet. It's like a a shared Excel spreadsheet uh, to everybody. And there were 26 things listed on there. Uh, There was a category for all of the different types of drinks, and there were categories for appetizers, um, and we had to be clear about that. Everyone couldn't bring cheese. This was not like a situation where you could just like generically sign up for an appetizer. Um, And we had four different proteins, and we had all of the different side dishes, and we had desserts, and and this is just, you know, a way that we could feel prepared. And so then when we got to Thanksgiving dinner, and all 30 of us were sitting around, we were prepared. Um, And we were prepared to enjoy ourselves. And we did uh, because there wasn't a missing type of appetizer or a missing side dish or whatever it was. Um, Preparation for major events is a key to enjoying them, right? Whenever you go to a new city, don't you think beforehand about maybe looking to see what you should do or what the city's known for, checking things out so you're prepared to enjoy the city when you're there, I do this with restaurants. Um, I look at menus beforehand. So if I'm going to go, even if I've been somewhere before, but especially if somewhere is brand new, I get online and I look for their menu uh, because I want to prepare to enjoy myself when I'm there. And I don't want to be sitting in a panic wondering if I've ordered the wrong thing because I only had, you know, a minute to think about it. Even if you are out there thinking to yourself, um, I don't prepare like that. That's not my style. You know, that doesn't really track with me. I would bet that even for people who maybe fly by the seat of their pants a bit more, they prepare for the major things, right? If you're going to have somebody really important over for dinner, if your boss is going to come over for dinner or um, some special guest, you're probably going to prepare your house. You're going to do those things you've been putting off, like change the light bulbs that have just needed changing for a while. Or if you are in my house, you will pick up the stuff from the bottom of the stairs that somehow doesn't make it upstairs ever because everyone is capable of just passing by over and over again. Preparation 
is key for major events. It makes them go smoothly and be more enjoyable. The imagery that John the Baptist is using here is imagery that would be familiar to all of these folks because in the ancient Near East and in the first century of Palestine, there was a sense of a preparation for an important person coming called the parousia. Uh, And that's a Greek word that just means the great presence. And this is what happened whenever a king or an emperor would come and they would like inspect their city. They'd want to come and look at the places from which they collected taxes. And so in preparation for the parousia, the great presence coming, uh, they would send people ahead, workmen, to go and make the path straight. If there had been potholes, they would fill those in. If the valleys had dipped too low or gotten too crooked, they would start to kind of smooth that out so that the way of the king could be a really easy one to prepare the way. And John is saying the same thing to the people here. Uh, When they come to him and say, what should we do? He's saying, you need to make smooth this path. Essentially, instead of it being a road, it's in your heart. What is in your heart that has gotten potholed? What is in your heart that has gotten crooked? that is preventing you from having a smooth path to receive the Messiah. And he tells them it's sin. And he says that all of this sin, this missing the mark, uh, these ways that you've separated yourself from God, these are the things that make it hard for you to receive the Messiah. Uh, It's not that God can't get to you. It's that you aren't able to receive the Messiah when your life has all of these barriers in it. And so he says you need to practice a baptism of repentance and do something Um, different in your life to truly change. Today, when I started the sermon, I started with a prayer. Uh, It's one that you hear often. It's one I uh, regularly start my sermons with. It's from Psalm 1914. And it says, may the words of my mouth, but the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in God's sight. It's this invitation to the shared experience of a message. But John does something a little bit different. You'll notice back in the text, uh, he starts the first words that he says to the people. It's a broadside. He says, you brood of vipers. Can you imagine if I just walked up here after Ashley saying that beautiful offering that put our hearts like in line with the Lord. And I was like, you brood of vipers. Probably would have lost your attention. I, maybe I'll try that at 945. Um, I don't know how far we would have gotten. Uh, but John keeps going with the broadsides because he says, um, you think you're okay because you're a part of the covenant of Abraham? You're not okay. These are words that I think are easy for us to miss because we don't always grasp the significance of the covenant of Abraham. But this would have been an absolute affront to Jews at the time. Like they think, well, you know, we probably have done things wrong. We probably need a little forgiveness. But the truth of the matter is we're in the covenant. So we're good, right? Like this is the covenant that God made with Abraham and then renewed with Isaac and with Jacob and then got renewed again with uh, Moses and David and and we're in it. And so we're going to always be okay. And, And here John's saying, no, God can raise up stones to be Abraham's. You don't necessarily get to be in it. If there's a stone, meaning a hard heart, that is willing to repent and experience this baptism of repentance, they're more likely to be in the covenant than you. And I think that's important for us because we kind of do the same thing sometimes. We have this sense that we're like, well, we're probably good, right? Like maybe we need to have some repentance, but mostly we're okay. There's there's a... Um, a song that's by Todd Snyder called I Think I'm an All Right Guy that I think paints a really good picture of the way that we often feel about ourselves. He says, I know I get wild and I know I get drunk, but it ain't like I got a bunch of bodies in my trunk. I think I'm an all right guy. I just want to live until I got to die. I know I ain't perfect, but God knows I try. I think I'm an all right guy. It appears that for most of us, if we don't have a bunch of bodies in our trunk, we think of ourselves as all right guys. It's just, it's good enough, right? It's close enough. We're, we're in. I think a more accurate picture of what we are actually like is, this is one of my favorite quotes, is from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He's a Russian philosopher. He says this. He says, if only it were all so simple, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. 
no matter how we personally grade our sin, if it's just a little bit okay or kind of bad, the truth of the matter is that the line between good and evil runs through every single one of us. And so every single one of us has things in our heart for which we need to repent. And we can't rest on the fact that we have been a Christian for a long time or we're born into a Christian family. Just like the Jews can't rest on the fact that they're a part of the covenant of Abraham. John's saying that we actually have to bear fruit worthy of repentance. Here's what that means. All of the folks that came to ask John for a baptism of repentance said, after they heard him preach, what then should we do? And John says your first step is this baptism of repentance. Now look... A lot of us might think, wait, we're getting the order wrong here. Didn't baptism come with Jesus, right? It's a sacrament in the Christian church because Jesus was baptized. What is this other baptism that the Jews were practicing? It's not like what we think of as baptism now, this initiation into the new covenant and the new life of Jesus. This is a different type of baptism that John the Baptist, that the Essenes, that other Jews were practicing. Uh, And John was out in the middle of the wilderness. He was out at this place called Enon near Salim, which is just north of the Dead Sea, inviting people out to be baptized as a way of cleansing them, of purifying them. But it wasn't a once and for all thing. People would have to come and be washed clean of their sin regularly because they kept falling back into sin. But it was a baptism of repentance. The Greek word is metanoia. And what that really means, it's a sense of like a changed heart, a changed mind uh, that results in a changed life. It's not just um, enough Repentance for John, repentance at this time, isn't just to say, oh, I'm sorry, and move on with your life. It actually means that there is a full change in everything about your life, that you turn and do things in different ways. Uh, It gives the sense of like a physical, there's a physical connotation to it, that if you're going this way in your life, to truly metanoia, you would go this way in your life, and something would be really different. And so it's about marking a real um, and meaningful and lasting change. The other day, I found myself saying to one of the girls, I think it was to Mary Holland, don't just say you're sorry, show me you're sorry. And all of a sudden, I thought, oh my gosh, I sound like my mom, right? That You never think you're going to sound like your parent until all of a sudden you sound like your parent. The words come out and you think, oh, where did that come from? But I remember so clearly my mom saying to us when we were growing up so often, don't just say you're sorry, show me you're sorry. Change your behavior. Do something different. How often are we in relationships with people, and sometimes we're the perpetrator, and sometimes something has happened to us, but there's just a quick, oh, I'm sorry, you know, this this kind of dismissive, let's just get over it, let's just say we're sorry and be done with it, but not actually change anything meaningful about our behavior. John's saying, I want to see a corresponding change in your behavior that bears good fruit, because he says, look, The axe is lying at the root of the tree, so every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. We're familiar with this imagery because you remember Jesus says something similar in Luke 6. He says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit. Figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good So the person who has practiced metanoia, has practiced repentance, who is really going to change, produces good. And the evil person, out of his evil treasure, that's the person that clings to their sin, that says, I don't need to change. I'm a part of the house of Abraham. I've been a Christian my whole life. I'm okay. I don't need to do anything different. They produce evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so to each of these groups who says to John, so what then should we do? John gives them advice. And you'll notice that John is a pragmatist in this advice. John's not telling them that they have to do a grand feat of faith. His teaching is hardly revolutionary. He actually gives them really simple ways to address the temptations of uh, their context. So for the crowds, he says, go to your closet, look in it. Do you have an extra coat? Give that coat to someone that doesn't have a coat. And... um, 
for the tax collectors, he says, hey, do you have, um, do you take too much as a regular part of your job? Don't skim off the top. Don't make other people's lives harder. Don't steal from them. To the soldiers, he says, you get paid. Be satisfied with what you're getting paid. Don't extort people so you can get paid a little bit more. To everyone, he says, is there extra food in your pantry? Go look and then give that food to somebody else. This feels... I think more like the stuff of kindergarten than it does the stuff of eternal salvation. But I think that is Luke's point here. He's trying to show us that in whatever context we're in, we are able to do it um, in a way that is holy and is just and is filled with generosity. In fact, it's important to see this. He doesn't actually tell the tax collectors, go get a new job. You have a slimy job. Go get a new one. He doesn't say to the soldiers, get out of the army. That's where the trouble is. He says, stay right where you are. So all of you, wherever you are, God's not calling you out of that thing in order to bear fruit of repentance. God's saying, in the thing you're doing, resist the temptations that are inherent to your thing and live in a way that is more holy, that doesn't steal from others, that is just. Think about what you're doing and where you cut corners and stop doing that thing. John was trying to say there are everyday mundane moments of your life that you can act in. There, there's a Dutch theologian, Abraham Cooper, and he's famous for saying there is, here's what he says, there's not one square inch of this universe about which Christ cannot say, that is mine. The coming of Christ, the season of Advent, the preparing for the Messiah, this is a grand thing. And we think about it encompassing powers and principalities and kings and monarchies and rulers, right? But what John the Baptist is saying here is it's really encompassing things like cooking dinner for your family and not snapping at your spouse when they're on your final nerve and doing your Excel spreadsheets with integrity, Look at this passage and notice the names at the beginning. Luke says this happens in the time of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor, Herod, his brother Philip, Lysanias, during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, right? Um, These are big and powerful names. If this was about today, it would say, this is during the time of Joe Biden and Greg Abbott and Lizzie Fletcher and John Cornyn. But what John's saying is, The greatest thing happening in the cosmos isn't happening with all of those people. The greatest thing happening in the cosmos is happening with everyday, ordinary people, in our everyday, ordinary lives. This passage should ask each of us internally, what is it that you're doing with your everyday, your ordinary, your sleeping, your eating, your going to work, your walking around life that is bearing fruit worthy of repentance? Um, that's this last week I was driving with my dad and we were, uh, going down the road in a car in front of us, kind of pulled off the road a little bit to the side, but not quite off the road. And we get past the car and my dad said, I think that person was in trouble. Let's go back and check. And so we park and we get out of the car and we go back and, uh, and we look and there's a girl who is like, I mean, I'm not even sure she was old enough to drive, just barely old enough to drive, brand new driver, and she has run out of gas. And so all of a sudden, without thinking about it, my dad hails this guy down who's on the side of the road, just walking on the sidewalk, and my dad was like, hey, come help me push this car. So they push it off of the road onto the sidewalk so it was out of danger, and there's a gas station like a block and a half from where we were. So we went over, and we got a can of gas, and we brought it back and filled up this girl's tank, and all I could think about was... Check your closet for empty coats, I mean extra coats, and check your pantry for extra food. And maybe what you have is extra gas or the means to get it. Maybe what you have is extra time. Maybe what you have is something that somebody needs that is in your everyday, ordinary, walking around life. It's not like you're going out and looking for it, except that you live your life in a way that looks for opportunities to do this, to bear fruit worthy of repentance, to give yourself away to other people. That's one of the hallmarks of the way that we live at Advent here at St. Luke's is we practice giving ourselves away in generosity and service as a way of making smooth the path for the Lord. And so this year, we are going to have a Christmas offering for Habitat for Humanity. This spring, starting in March, we're going to build a Habitat for Humanity house, and we're going to make smooth somebody's life. And so our Christmas offering, every dollar that is given to that is going to go towards this house. 
It's going to take somebody out of striving to pay rent for substandard housing to being able to afford a payment for a house they'll own. It's going to change a family's life. It's going to change actually generations of that family's life. I think that so often we forget that the mission of the church is to see lives changed one at a time, to bring people closer to Jesus, to make them more like Jesus, for us to change our own lives one at a time, to live more like Jesus. To take people who are on a zigzag and show them grace so that their path can be made straight. I find myself during Christmas often, and I bet you do this too, panicking about presents and about decorations and saying to people like, are you ready for Christmas? How often will you get asked that in this next month? People are going to be like, are you ready for Christmas? Are you ready for Christmas? And I wonder if the posture of our hearts instead of are you ready for Christmas could be, what then shall we do? John tells us that we are to bring in the bulldozers and make level the paths in the world and in our lives that aren't straight, that are full of potholes, to lower the hills and raise up the valleys, to stop practicing selfishness and greed and conceit and pride, to do things that that make for a new way, a new path. We're so used to our paths, right? It's like that idea of the line of good and evil cutting through all of our hearts. We stop seeing it. It blurs together and our paths make sense to us, but that is not a path that prepares for the Lord. What then shall we do? We shall bring in the bulldozers and we shall prepare the way. Let's pray. God, we have let it get so crooked in so many places in our lives and we have just let potholes get deeper and deeper because we have buried ourselves in the same sins and it's just become a way of ease for us. And so I pray that in this season, you would truly call us to see those places in our lives that we might be able to practice a baptism of repentance, of metanoia, of turning, of having changed hearts, change minds, letting those things lead us to change lives. God, I pray that every single day we would wake up and instead of feeling frenzied, are we ready? Are we ready? We might say to you, what then shall we do? And in your grace, you would answer us. We love you and we pray this in your name. Amen.